Hi, I'm here with Kyle Portbury. Um, he is a graduate from Avondale University College back in 2002, so going nearly 20 years. He graduated from a Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Teaching. Welcome, Kyle. How are you? Very well, Rachel. Thank you for having me. Now, currently, tell us where you're living and who you're living with. <laughs> uh, so currently, I'm living with my family in uh, the beautiful Cape Town, which is in South Africa, obviously. And, uh, and we've been here for the last 18 months. We live on the opposite side of the mountain to Cape Town City. So you go um, over a, a mountain pass through a national park called our Caps of Egg. And then we basically just live on the peninsula so if you google cape of good hope that's where we live okay, 20 you, minutes from the entrance of a big national park and have you had a chance to go like to the national park or sort of see anything interesting because i know you know covid's been what 12 months sort of thing so have you had an opportunity to almost to explore yeah. a little bit yeah we've still got out and and done trips and stuff and particularly before um pandemic lockdowns we got out and did quite a number of trips but like just you know you'd there's baboons that roam around the neighbourhood here, like on the way to school. Well, the kids were going to school last year. There's actually a lot of wildlife within a 20 minute radius of a house. You know, there's a penguin colony and um, zebra and ostrich and kudu and a whole bunch of other elan and uh, bonte box and stuff down in the in the national park just near us. So. It's during lockdown. It was nice. You could drive around and still see animals and wildlife and stuff. So, so that was nice. Yeah. We're going to backtrack a little bit. Um, you graduated 2002. Tell us where you went after that and sort of, I guess, your journey to where you are now in South Africa. So I graduated, I taught for a year in Australia um, and then got married, moved to the UK and then didn't like teaching in the UK. So retrained, went to a place called Drama Centre London and, and trained as an actor, but then accidentally ended up going behind camera because the one of the directors that came in for our final year films that we were doing um, was computer illiterate at the time and I wasn't. So he was doing a, a documentary on Marvin Gaye that he was trying to get funding for. So I wrote his film business plan, just Googled how you did it and then wrote one up for him so that he had a something and then because I knew what was in there he took me along to finance the year's pitches and they just assumed I was producing and so I did it was very random <laughs> so I like not it. knowing anything about producing at all other than the fact that I had googled a few things and then you just end up doing stuff and you do more things and then all of a sudden you're like oh I guess this is what I do now all right great so I did a, a master's in performance at drama center when I was at, at uh, there. And so from the UK, where did you go? Because you were there, what, five years, was it? Yeah, almost five years. And then uh, I came back to Australia and was creative director of film and television at the Media Centre in Wurrunga for six years. And then CHIP for Complete Health Improvement Program got redone during that era. Um, the Beyond the Search series, we did that, which was fabulous fun. And then I went to Texas and was a film professor running the film program at an Adventist university over there, Southwestern, um, which was also fabulous fun. And then an opportunity came up to uh, be an in-house writer director at an um, animation studio of all random things because mm -hmm. I'd never done animation before. And yet here I am doing animation in Africa, go figure. So I want yeah. to get into that sort of creative area where you're working a little bit more. And, and we've talked about you being a director, but as a director, what is your role and what are you responsible for? Part of, I'd say most of your role is actually human resource management. So it's, it's how are you managing those creative collaborations so that everybody is moving in the same direction at the same time, you know, so from a story point of view, I can be really clear so that everyone understands, okay, so this is what's happening right now. Um, and then it's your role to kind of make sure that all of those big personalities on set that day actually can all work together and it can be a, a fun um, functioning set. So like it, it's quite, yeah, it's, uh, I love it because I love, 
hanging out with people. So that relational side of filmmaking, I find quite natural. Do you yeah. get a special chair that says Portbury? <laughs> if you want one, I've never actually I'm wanted joking. one. I find it a bit pretentious. <laughs> no, but you can and people do and that's fine. But like personally, I don't actually like the little embroidered. I do like those chairs though, by the way, those Southwesters are very comfortable. <laughs> Is there anything, any stories, like anything that's happened that's sort of been one of your biggest or memorable challenges that you've faced in that sort of creative and director space? So I did a, a film following seven disabled climbers up Kilimanjaro 12 years ago. And when you find yourself on the side of a mountain going, I actually don't know what I'm doing. And I also can't breathe properly right now. And I may have bitten off more than I can chew. Like that's quite a... Yeah, all of a sudden you have to just kind of go, right, my brain is working very slowly at altitude right now. And, mm -hmm. and I also don't know enough about what I've said I know. And you, you just have to work out how to, in extreme and intense situations, how to get still get the best out of yourself and others and not like kill those relationships and actually kill people at the same time, right? You can't tell seven disabled climbers can you guys just backtrack so that we can make that crane shot work, right? Because you get one shot at it, which is when they come past. So you have to have worked out how to do that crane move before they get there so that you can nail that move once because they're not going back so that you can do it again because that would be ridiculous, right? Mm. So I ended up doing it. And so after you've done that a couple of times, like you're, you're like, why do I not feel great? Right. Oh, that's right. Cause we're at 15,000 feet and my body is not working properly. So let's, let's talk about one of your films. A couple of years ago, you did an animation on the speech by Sojourner Truth, Ain't I a Woman? So can you tell us a little bit about it and what actually prompted you to do that? Cause it's, I mean, over here, maybe in Australia, it's not as well known as in the States, but give us an idea of what led you to, to do that. With all these things, you got to do a lot of research. So when I was doing research for Tell the World, she came up a couple of times in research because she was not Adventist. She was in and around Battle. She lived in Battle Creek. So she knew the Whites. She knew Joseph Bates and his wife. So because she was there, she came up and I tried to work her in because she's a really fascinating character. Um, and I, I really admire people who have, who get, annoyed by stuff to the point where they will actually um, get up and they will speak out to their detriment right so that she paid a heavy price for that speech because of the context right and the time so she as a woman she got up and had the audacity to speak at a women's convention where only men were speaking go figure but it was 1851 so I mean you know it wasn't sexism back then it was just what it was um, but everyone has focused previously on just the speech and the context around what provoked her to want to get up and, and actually speak it in the first place is a series of men getting up and being very patronising about women at a convention for women. Mm. And so that really fascinated me. I was like, oh, that's it. So I, I just had it sitting in a, in a folder on my computer for many years. And then I pitched some a grant funding through the university when I was at Southwestern and it was only a small amount of money. Um, and I was going to do it as live action. And then I was like, I can't do it. So they gave me the grant. And then I was like, I can't actually do this for this money. Like this will, this film won't work. So in my naivete, I went, oh, animation would be cheaper. No, as it turns out, far more expensive, but I found an a animation studio in Brazil who liked the story and just went, you know what, we'll do it around Coke ads that we're doing in Brazil today. So you and your, you and your but colleagues yeah, obviously put a lot of passion into that because you won an award for it. This is your brag moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, you know, and my caveat to this brag moment is that you, you should – I mean, awards are lovely and they're fun and all the rest of it, but, uh, you know, they should never be your motivation for doing it and it wasn't. It's always surprising when it gets recognised after the fact, right? It did quite well on the festival circuit before it won an Emmy and it was always fascinating. You, you would get people look around when you would come, when you would walk up for Q&As after it would screen 
and there was a lot of confusion, A, as to that it had been made by a white guy, for instance. <laughs> People would be like, that's odd. And then you would open your mouth and you'd start talking and they'd get even more confused because you've got an Australian accent now. And so you get these fabulous um, questions from the audience, which is like, so why did you want to make this film? <laughs> And so I always would go, which was always quite disarming, and you get a lot of laughs after. They're like, well, I'm a white guy with a beard in his 40s from Australia. It just made sense. Winning an Emmy is nice, but having a conversation with someone who's telling you their real-world experience mm. and, and saying to you that, you know, that they're glad that you actually tackled that because they're able to then think about their own circumstance in a different light. I mean, that's great. That's the whole reason why you you tell stories in the first place, right? So that somebody is provoked into thinking or feeling something that they wouldn't have otherwise. Tell us about the next one that's coming up because that's an animation as well. So you're going, you're doing something that you said cost more than you thought and was a bit more challenging <laughs> than you thought. So I guess I could yes. ask why animation, but also tell us a little bit about your next project in that area. The next one, which has been done here in South Africa. Uh, is it's a, a small sliver of um, the story of a guy called Johan Wiedner, who was an Adventist who saved you know, over a thousand Jews and allied pilots during World War II. You know, there's, there's books on Johan, there's, you know, a documentary floating around on YouTube about it, but no one's actually dramatized it before randomly. Like it's, it's on a par with Schindler's List kind of level yeah. of story. Like it's MacGyver meets Schindler's List and yet there's nothing about it. So I love that you're, you, you're sort of yeah. picking out those stories not that not everyone's heard of, but that are incredibly impactful and transforming the communities that they're in. I always look at these people and I go, I would, yeah, if I got placed in the situation, for instance, that Johan got placed in, you, you would like to think that you would be the hero in that story. You wouldn't be. Mm. You'd, you'd be the dude who was just like hanging out in his house because that was the safer place to be, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm quite inspired by these people's ability to, they saw something and it affected them enough that it got them out of their comfort zone and actually like so far out that they were regularly getting shot at. And, you know, he had at one stage in Southern France, he had the highest bounty of anyone in France and Germany at the time in re any resistance organization going on. And that's why I like tackling these stories because I, I am provoked to think and feel and do differently when I engage with them and try and mm. work out, well, what, what is the difference there? Like you have the same basic faith underpinning, you have the same basic view, worldview that I do. So what is the difference between why you you did it and I'm going, oh, I don't maybe I wouldn't, I don't know. You know, is it just that you were put in a situation and I'm not in that situation? Who knows? So that's what I find fascinating. And that's why I go, well, I'd like other people to have that mental journey as well. So I guess over the last uh, 20 years, you know, you, you've worked on quite a few projects. <laughs> I know, I just wanted to throw it. Terrific that. when somebody says that, isn't it? You're like, oh man. <laughs> I'm now that middle-aged dude. Like, yep. when did that happen? <laughs> like, yeah, it's quite, oh, goodness. So you, you've done a few. Is there any that have been, I guess, personally meaningful to you more than the others? Yeah, I still, you know, so I, I talked about Mountain Within, which is the, the one on Kilimanjaro, um, both from a, the people that you got to know who had disabilities and were overcoming those climbing a mountain, also, just like even in post-production side of it, like I recorded the score for that at Abbey Road, which was just mind-blowingly amazing. And it's one of those ones where I watch it still, like every now and again, like every couple of years, I'll watch it with somebody. And you'll sit back and you'll go, I, you know, yes, there's flaws and mistakes in it, but the sum total of that, I love this movie still. And just to drag yeah. you back to the college days, you know, one more time, or just a shout out to any lecturers or, you know, even a friend or someone who made a positive impact on you here while you were studying at college. And I say here because I guess, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here at college right now. So, yeah. 
I couldn't narrow it down. Everyone is fabulous. No, you have to narrow it down, right? What's the point of saying everyone's fabulous? You, <laughs> you are. Everyone is fabulous. But if I had to narrow it down, which you're telling me I have to, it would be Don Hansen and Robin Priestley. Because the, the skills and A, their classes were just a lot of fun and they, um, they let me off for coming to them in wetsuits with sand and probably ruining the carpet upstairs in the humanities area. They instilled a fabulous sense of um, research integrity, which uh, I have used and drawn on extensively. So having done a history English um, with a minor in physical education, go figure, but have used the research knowledge that came out of there, like almost on a daily basis mm. for the last 20 years, say. So. Well, Kyle, thanks for spending time with me. Thanks for, for joining us and sharing a bit of your journey and what you're up to and what you're doing. If people want to sort of have a look at some of these clips that we've been talking about, we've got the link on our web, um, just here on the page. You can go and uh, click on that. We'll also post that um, on our social media for people to go and have a look at. We'll, we'll try and follow your journey and, and see where you head next. Thanks. Lovely. Thank you, Rachel. Appreciate it.